Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. Our Bible teacher will be Gunther von Haringa Sr. So without further ado, let's look into God's Word, the Bible. This is going to be Nahum Part 4, and today's date is October 31st, uh, 2016. I'll read verses uh, 3 to 8 of chapter 1. Jehovah is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Jehovah hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world, and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Jehovah is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. In our previous study, we began looking at the phrase, and the clouds are the dust of his feet, which is comprised of three words, uh, and the clouds, uh, Strong's number 6051, are the dust, Strong's number 80, and of his feet, Strong's number 7272, which, as I mentioned previously, is a very interesting expression. And these three terms are only found in this verse. In our last study, we focused on the word feet. And since this is referring to God's feet, and spiritually the foot or feet represent the will of the one in view, in this case, God himself, so then how are we to understand the phrase and the clouds are the dust of his feet or the dust of his will. The Hebrew word rendered as and the clouds, Strong's number 6051, is translated 81 times as cloud and six times as cloudy, as the following references show. The earliest citation in the Bible regarding clouds is in Genesis 9, 12 through 17 in which this term appears in verses 13 through 14 and 16, as God promises to never destroy the earth by a flood again, verified by the appearance of a rainbow in the cloud, underscoring God's unswerving faithfulness to his commandments as outlined in the Bible. And God said, this is the token of the covenant, covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. 
this is also seen in Ezekiel 128 in which it is rendered as in the cloud and this entire chapter is dealing with the glory of Jehovah. Additionally, uh, you might want to note the identical word for rainbow or bow, which is used three times in Genesis 9, 13, 14, and 16, and appears here as well. As the appearance of the bow, and bow, by the way, is uh, Strong's number 7198, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Jehovah. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. In these passages, we see the cloud associated with God himself and his divine attributes of mercy and glory. And equally important, as it symbolizes the word of God. We also read in Exodus 16, 10, And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of Jehovah appeared in the cloud. One of the most notable examples of this word is found in the last verses of Exodus 40, actually verses 34 to 38, uh, at the completion of the tabernacle. Not only does the cloud represent the presence of God 24-7, but it also served to indicate the will of God concerning what God would have his people to do with regards to resting in one of their 42 encampments or to resume traveling to the next site. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Jehovah was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Incidentally, the root word for cloud, 6051, is spelled identically, and it's 6049, but its significance is diametrically opposed in 10 of the 11 verses where it appears. We first find it in a citation we looked at a little while ago in Genesis 9:14, where it is translated as, when I bring. And it shall come to pass, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. More commonly, this term is rendered these ways, observer of times, soothsayer, sorceress, and enchanter, as these next passages illustrate, indicating where their trust resided. Deuteronomy 18.10 and 14 warn, There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times. Here it's an observer of times, and also in verse 14 it's repeated, or an enchanter or a witch. Uh, verse 14, For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, Jehovah thy God hath not suffered or not allowed thee so to do. 
with regards to Manasseh, king of Judah, Second Chronicles 33, 6 declares, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the sin of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with, fam with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of Jehovah to provoke him to anger. So we recognize that if clouds represent the word of God, whether for mercy or for judgment, in God's feet, his will, how does the dust fit in spiritually as we read that the clouds are synonymous with dust? The clouds are the dust of his feet. The term are the dust in Nahum 1.3 is Strong's number 80 which only occurs in five other references, and like uh, Nahum 1.3, they all refer to judgment, as we shall presently see. Exodus 9.9 9 chronicles the plague of boils that God brought upon the Egyptians, man and animal alike. Uh, this word is rendered, and it shall become small dust. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 28:24 outlines the blessings and then the more numerous curses that God prescribed for disobedience to his holy commands. Here this term is translated as powder. Jehovah shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Isaiah 5.24, I should say Isaiah 5, is a historical parable of the vineyard, uh, typifying national Israel and, by extension, the churches and denominations that God abandoned on May 21, 1988, even as he finalized his divorce from Israel when Christ hung on the cross in 33 AD. In verse 24 of Isaiah 5, this word is rendered as dust. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of Jehovah of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 29, 5 is an indictment against Israel, excuse me, against Jerusalem that typifies, again, the New Testament churches and denominations that came under God's wrath according uh, to his divine decree, in which Strong's number 80 is translated dust. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away, yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. Ezekiel 26.10 is another pronouncement of judgment against Tyre this time, and once again is a spiritual portrait of the churches and denominations, and rendered as their dust. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy wall shall shake at the noise of their horsemen, and of the wheels and of the chariots, when he shall enter into thy gates as men enter into a city wherein is made a breach. Thus, each of these passages have a common thread of retribution running through them, pointing to the fact that in this setting, God's word, the clouds, is judgment. In other words, uh, the dust according to his will or his feet. 
I would also like to point out that the root word for dust is Strong's number 79 and also spelled identically to Strong's number 80. It's only found in two citations having to do with Jacob wrestling God, a picture of the elect spiritually striving to enter into the kingdom of God and found in Genesis 32, 24 to 25. In the historical context, this would have taken place on the ground and most likely they would have gotten dusty in the process. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So here it's uh, rendered as in verse uh, 24, alone and there wrestled. And then in verse 25, as he wrestled. Moreover, we know from other passages in the Bible that are rendered as dust, that dust implies death, as the most common term for dust is strong. 83, found, for instance, in Genesis 3, 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. All right, let's uh, move on to verse 4 uh, in Nahum 1, and we'll consider the first phrase in this verse, which is also comprised of three Hebrew words. He rebuketh, Strong's number 1605, the sea, 3220, and maketh it dry. 2717, and drieth up all the rivers, Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. These three words are only found together in verse 9 of Psalm 106, but I'll read the context from verses 7 to 15, as this majestic chapter extols God's mercy and faithfulness to his corporate people in spite of their ongoing sinfulness. Notice how God delivered them time and time again and even destroyed their enemies, but also sent leanness into their soul as a chastisement. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt, they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. Those are the three words. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. They believe, excuse me, then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. As with Noah's flood, the water was the means for salvation of the elect in the ark and typified by the nation as a whole, as well as for destruction of the non-elect outside the ark and represented by Pharaoh and his army. Uh, as we read in 1 Peter 3.20 and 2 Peter 2.5, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited 
in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And then 2 Peter 2, 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Well, on that hopeful and ominous note, we'll have to stop here today and, Lord willing, pick up our study uh, in our next lesson. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.